Good day, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon all of you. Welcome to another session with Musa, the Movement for United South Africa. For those of you that haven't had an opportunity to be on Musa's programs before, I thought I'll just quickly mention to you that we have a series of programs. Musa has been actively meeting uh, since the lockdown days every night for about an hour or two, in fact, sometimes three hours uh, for over a year. And then uh, we decided to have a more broader program, more inclusive program after establishing the purpose of Musa, which is essentially conscientization, influencing towards greater good, amalgamating and working with other organizations, activists, uh, NGOs, civil society, and even government uh, to try to have more and more participation on aspects of common interest, things that we all agree on. Everyone wants to do good, but how do we amalgamate it, aggregate it, and work together? And that's the main uh, objective of Musa, to try and get more selflessness and activism coming together. We then uh, progressed last year with the appointment of our new chairperson, um, Karuna Mohan, who's also with us, uh, to try and have quarterly sessions rather than every Saturday, because the Saturday sessions are becoming quite, uh, quite a lot, and we weren't doing justice to following up. So now we have, we've been having quarterly sessions, and these quarterly sessions have been broad. So in the past, we've had sessions with economists, we've had sessions with youth, We've had sessions with uh, uh, specialist groups, including uh, uh, areas of gender-based violence and women. Uh, we've had sessions with uh, political associates. Uh, this last few sessions have been with uh, faith groups and business people. And today, we're having a session on aspects which Musa is quite keen on because it's, it's related to unity. Uh, you've all seen the uh, local and global aspects of the government of national unity in the ANC, the liberation movement of South Africa, which has been running South Africa for, for a few decades now. Uh, in, in this last 30 years, we haven't seen the kind of progress we wanted to. And the ANC has lost ground. Uh, and there's a lot of acknowledgement of the weaknesses within the ANC. But we've also seen this move, which relates to what we often called for, uh, but it's not a perfect gel. And what we've always called for is that government shouldn't be uh, opposition and a ruling party. Everyone elected has a mandate and everyone should be in parliament serving the people on common objectives. So we've often pushed for that. But the reality is it's not as simple because different agendas, political uh, uh, left, right views, conservative views, and we'll hear a bit more about that from our speakers, hopefully. These influences, egos especially, and the element of corruption, uh, and also ability, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is key. So Musa also decided to have a session on what's quite important uh, in the debate in South Africa, and that's this uh, decision of the government of national unity, how we can um, look at the questions that uh, have been posed for the speakers to talk about. Uh, and if we if we try and address these questions, hopefully we'll come to a better understanding, try and help each other influence things in, in a better way. Um, and we're quite keen to get perspectives from stalwarts and people like yourselves. So um, in my opening year, and welcome to all of you from all over the world, I see uh, also some associates from Korea. Welcome to you. Uh, and other participants and activists from our different groups, we want to have a dialogue, a conversation uh, between the three panel speakers and also with all of you that may have questions or contributions to make. These kind of conversations is what Musa has been trying to promote more and more so that there is a better understanding and a better influence uh, on some of the common vision we have for unity and for uh, selfless leadership. So without further ado, let me ask uh, our uh, one of our founding members of Musa, Yusuf Patel, to give us a, a clear overview and in summary form of what uh, the purpose of this session is and the document that he shared with all of you. 
on the government of national unity. Briefly, uh, over to you, Yusuf. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Faisal. Uh, before, you, before you go into it also, um, uh, I think just uh, if you could briefly uh, do an introduction of the three speakers, that would be appreciated. Uh, yes. So uh, greetings to everyone. And it's a real a pleasure to be part of this dialogue. And uh, I think uh, also we're really grateful to be joined by um you know the uh, the group of panelists that that we have uh, these are all renowned uh, and influential uh, people that i think uh, is going to enable a very useful discussion on this topic of a government of national unity um we we obviously have um, you know just 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 briefly as as we go into the the the, the overall purpose as Faisal was mentioning, the uh, Movement for United South Africa is an ad advocacy platform for socioeconomic justice, ethical leadership, and, and for promoting a transformative consciousness and transformative activism. Um, now, Musa is of the view that many years of governance erosion has resulted in a situation where the entire liberation project is potentially at uh, at risk. We've seen with the outcome of the 2024 elections, a you know complete political split that has taken place uh, with the uh, with the ruling ANC having now uh, lost a, a majority. And I think this is quite a significant moment in the evolution of uh, South Africa's development process. Um, our people are still living in you know, dire poverty, and we have one of the highest unemployment and inequality rates in, in the world. So the GNU the Government of National Unity is being presented as a stabilizing force. Uh, and I think stability is, is necessary, but what does stability, if stability means maintaining the current economic status quo, um, you know, then that uh, is going to be a major challenge for us as a country uh, in terms of dealing with, uh, with, with our particular challenges of overcoming economic exploitation, subjugation, and really uplifting, uplifting the majority of our people uh, and promoting socioeconomic development and justice. So the government of national unity is a is a sort of hard or bitter pill to swallow for many people. Uh, I mean, in the build up to the elections, you know, there were certain red lines that were put in place in terms of um, political parties that were campaigning and were openly even supporting injustices globally, uh, parties like the Democratic Alliance, um, yes, you know, supporting, uh, supporting the, the the situation, uh, in in fact, the genocide in 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 Palestine. Uh, so, with those red lines and that that were in place prior to the elections, with the formation of a government of national unity and bringing all different parties, uh, you know, together, uh, obviously, you know, poses a poses a great challenge. Um, you know, so there are views that obviously a GNU in its current form may even represent a a total sellout and, uh, you know, a, a sellout to the forces of owners of, of capital, um, Zionist forces, etc. Um, now, I think irrespective in terms of um, what we're sitting with in the current situation is that we do have now the, a government of national unity and irrespective of form of a government as citizens and civil society there has to be a relationship and an engagement with government and if we're saying on the basis of the fact that there has been a you know fairly credible uh, election and the center still holds in terms of the constitutional democracy and the electoral process that we have 
then within that framework, how do we, you know, then approach, uh, and as citizens, how do we look at the issue of a government of national unity? Um, and we've posed, you know, sort of uh, in, in terms of the topic, so a government of national unity, could it advance cooperation in the country? So we see better cooperation between a range of different forces and interests uh, for the betterment of the country? Uh, or could it be that the government of national unity uh, presents us with a case of co-option where we really actually, uh, you know, resolving to uh, give up on the project of really uh, moving ahead in a meaningful way with development and a developmental approach in the country? Um, or could a government of national unity actually mean that we really begin to shift towards some sort of radical change? And this is, you know, a radical change, I think, from a perspective of how government works and operates, but also from a perspective of citizens and civil society in terms of how uh, civil society and citizens can begin to formulate uh, a more activist basis, uh, a way of involvement and holding government accountable, but also progressing uh, in, uh, you know, in terms of meaningful contributions towards uh, socioeconomic development and upliftment. So, you know, these are the fundamental issues that have been posed. What does the GNU really mean? for socioeconomic justice in South Africa? What is the local and global governance context that we finding ourselves in? Uh, we know that whatever is happening in South Africa is fitting within broader global uh, power dynamics. Uh, how should citizens and civil society engage with the government of national unity? And how do we continue this sort of a dialogue uh, and in a way that we can begin to move towards more practical outcomes. So that's the broad kind of context for, uh, you know, for the discussion. And uh, I think joining us is uh, Professor Ellen, Ellen Busak. Um, and Professor Busak obviously is a well-renowned uh, uh, activist and he's been fundamental in terms of uh, being a stalwart in the freedom struggle in South Africa. Um, and, you know, as early as 1983, he called for the formation of a United Democratic Front at the time when um, we were in the midst of uh, the anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, and the UDF, you know, grew into one of the largest non-violent, non-racial and anti-apartheid formations in the history of the struggle. Um, Professor Busak is also a recipient of many honorary uh, awards. He's uh, an award-winning author as well, 24 books, and he's especially active in advocacy of uh, Palestinian rights and freedom. So we, we're really grateful to have uh, Professor Busak with us. Uh, and then we also have and welcome um, Shahid Bolson, who's a renowned geopolitical analyst and the founder of Middle Nation. And I think many people, um, you know, he's, he's prolific on social media, so uh, he doesn't need too much uh, of an intro. And I think many people have follow, follow his uh, work quite closely. Uh, and he's provide very, uh, you know, interesting perspectives on uh, global issues as, as they stand. He's, as I said, he's the founder of Middle Nation and he's a sought after commentator on, on global Muslim affairs. Beyond his analytical work, he's also a prolific speaker engaging audiences uh, worldwide. We also have on the panel, um, you know, an important and critical um, local voice in uh, Teto Mahlakwana. And that was a high impact and dynamic multi-dimensional -dimension, strategies uh, in governance and, and policy research. She has a background in, in, uh, in journalism, specializing in, in political economy. And her, her expertise in politi political economy has positioned her as one of the leading voices uh, in South Africa. She's also um, you know, received prestigious fellowships. Uh, she's 
showcase exceptional leadership in in navigating uh, challenging situations in the country. Uh, and she continues to make significant contributions to civic education, community engagement, and strategic narrative building. So uh, I think we really, uh, you know, we're really grateful, and I think um, we are also blessed to have uh, a panel that's uh, going to be able to really uh, lead and provide insightful debate and discussions with regard to the topic on the government of national unity. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Faisal. I think on that note, we would be ready yeah. for it. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, that was quite comprehensive and a good outline of the fantastic panel that we've got today. And remember, this is a dialogue and a conversation. Uh, so relax, share your deep views, share your uh, uh, perspectives freely and openly. It is a safe platform. I also want to inform everyone that there is um, a recording taking place. Um, so we will, like always, secure the recording, make it available for everybody on social media um, and uh, share it with you as well so that you can um, hopefully share it with others and spread the word of this uh, of the discussion and the good points that come out from it. Uh, one other thing I want to also uh, mention is that we are connected virtually, so please be uh, respectful and uh, courteous and also uh, allow for the fact that there might be some delays in the network and issues. So we've got a couple of people on standby as co-hosts who will um, assist us in ensuring that there aren't too many disruptions in people not putting their mics off and so on. Um, and yeah, let's get right into it. We've got uh, 15 minutes for each of the speakers. Uh, you may use that 15 minutes or less. If you, if you use less time, I'll take the opportunity to ask participants to ask a question or two so that the next session, which is the panel discussion between the three of you and our questions, uh, can take the discussion further on areas of interest for the three of you, which I'm sure will interest all of us as well. And then we will have uh, open participation for everyone else uh, on further questions and debates. Uh, clearly, we have much more participants than we anticipated, especially now that uh, the registration has been required. We usually um, have uh, the, the recording shared, and which is much more widely, but I'm glad we have all the people here. To Dan Roy and the people from Korea again who've joined, welcome. Uh, the insights that we're going to get locally from uh, Dr. Alan Busak and from Tato, and uh, the insights from Shai Bolson from a external perspective, I think, will be interesting for all of us. So let's go ahead with it immediately. Dr. Alan Busak, the floor is all yours. Thank you so very much, Chair, and thank you to everyone for this uh, actually quite wonderful opportunity to be part of uh, Musa's ongoing conversations about South Africa, uh, our democracy, where it stands, where it's going, uh, our place in the continent and our place in the global situation. I'm deeply honored to have my two colleagues uh, with me today. Um, in one way or another, I have heard or seen something of yourself. Um, and so it is a great privilege to be sharing uh, these uh, these two hours with you. So thank you for, for that. Um, I mean, I uh, one of the things that has been bothering me over the last few years, if I may begin there, was the fact that where South Africa once had a very vibrant and very vigorous and very politically engaged civil society, um, thinking back indeed to the days of, um, of the United Democratic Front that Yusuf has mentioned, uh, that in the last 30 years, we have uh, not been able to maintain that level of public and civic engagement. Um, into this democratic experiment that we have been having uh, for this time. Uh, partly uh, because I think that people almost accepted that the, that, the, that the end, the official end of the apartheid era meant that the kind of activism that we found to be absolutely necessary 
in the struggle days, how long it may have taken, um, can now be relaxed a little bit. Um, that we have a government that we have elected is a democratic situation, and 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 that we will have a government that will take over so many of the responsibilities that we thought were ours uh, in those days when we were having a government that was uh, clearly an adversary of, of the people and of the dreams and hopes and aspirations of the people. That was one thing. On the other hand, I have also come to the conclusion that the African National Congress itself has done its very best to stifle the voices from civil society, um, to make sure that with this mantra that we are now in a situation where the government is our government, our elected government, our liberation movement, that they will indeed do what the people always had wanted government to do. And so, so the kind of, of active um, interaction, um, even if adversarially so, between government and, 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 and civil society uh, was no longer necessary. I mean, I remember uh, speaking from the side of the churches, uh, certainly. I remember the, the, the conference of the South African Council of Churches in 2004, when President Mbeki was invited as the main speaker. And he was very clear. And he said, look, this thing that the churches have always thought of themselves as part of the vanguard of the struggle, that we were going to be a watchdog over, over government and society, and that we're going to hold government accountable as, as churches representing a large chunk of, of, of our people, um, that, that, that has come to an end. He says, you are, you, that, that role is no longer necessary. What the church should be doing, he says, is to simply accept uh, and support what he called the national agenda, as that national agenda has already been set by the African National Congress. And so our role would be supportive. Our role would be in solidarity. Our role would not be in critical engagement of what government wants to do or would in fact be doing in our name. And while I was not completely surprised that he would say that, because in the 1990s, I have seen how President Mandela has reacted to the church's critical stance on the, the arms deal scandal, for instance, and how, and how Mr. Mandela spoke to the church and said, this is not your job um, to criticize us in this way. So I was not completely surprised. What surprised me? was the willingness with which the South African Council of Churches accepted that role as now imposed upon us by government. So that kind of situation has grown to the extent that now we are battling to get civil society back into the conversation and back into an activist mode and back into a situation where we realize that what we thought was the end of the struggle in 1994 is actually only the beginning of a new struggle. That what was promised and what was actually done was not by any means the same thing. Um, so, so my appreciation therefore, just in brackets of what Musa is trying to do is very, very great and very deep. And I thank you for the role that you are playing in that regard. This kind of conversation is, is very, very necessary. And so since last year, uh, with the sort of renewed efforts from some quarters to revive the United Democratic Front to serve a new certain political purpose in support of an African National Congress that was clearly understanding that it is beginning to lose ground amongst the people, that it had no confidence anymore in the hearts of the people, that the trust had been broken down, that the support has been breaking down. When that debate began to rise again, I was going around the country trying to understand what is it that people actually want. Is it possible to revise something like a united democratic front, not the UDF of the 1980s, but something like it for our situation now. And it struck me how difficult that conversation was. And one of the reasons why the conversation was so difficult is because the elections keep on coming in the way. 
um, everybody was saying to me, yes, that's a very good idea, but the most urgent thing right now is the elections. Yes, that's a very good idea, but keep it as a long-term project. Let us get the elections out of the way because people still felt that the elections was going to give some kind of clarity in the murkiness of dissatisfaction that we have been feeling for such a long time. Well, now the elections have come and gone. The murkiness has not disappeared. The confusion has been exacerbated. But the exploitation of the, exp of the confusion is greater and clearer to us now than it was before the election. And so now that we have the government of national unity, uh, now I detect that people are much more willing to not just talk, but to participate quite vigorously in these debates. And so when uh, some weeks ago I published an article about my views about the government of national unity and how I see that, uh, the responses were, 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 were quite encouraging. And I am happy to say that that is part of what I see, that there is a new willingness of our people to participate, to debate, to give their opinion, and not just that, but to now talk once more of the possibility of building a civil society, bringing organizations in our communities together, faith communities and, and, other, and other groups, to not just challenge the, the GNU, but to keep the GNU accountable and to make sure that a set of values over against what we see the GNU is doing and what it stands for, which is not, in my view, very encouraging, instead very, very discouraging, absolutely, that that, 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 that kind of conversation, those values, those principles, those foundational issues that we believe that we fought for and that so many people sacrificed and gave their lives for, that those things become part of our conversation about rebuilding our democracy again. We also want to make sure, from my point of view, that we understand that this government of national unity is not just a South African thing. It has a profound impact, and the idea is to have a profound impact on whatever plans or dreams or hopes we have had in building a genuine and a new and a different kind of pan-Africanism with everything that is happening in the continent, but that it also has plans to refit ourselves in the global struggles. And we are moving away from a unipolar world absolutely uh, run by American imperialism and hegemony to a more multipolar world. And in my view, the government of national unity as it functions now in South Africa, with the absolutely dominant role of the DA and the factions in the ANC that have been part DA for such a long time, to put it that way, that we have to be very, very clear on where South Africa is going geopolitically, where the future of our country lies, where the future of the continent lies, and what is it that South Africans must be doing in order to make sure that we secure a different kind of future than what I see emerging as an agenda for our global participation coming from the GNU. And maybe, Chairperson, I should stop there um, to, to make sure that my colleagues have enough time to put forth their point of view, but thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alan Busak. I think that was a very refreshing touch on some elements that uh, touched my heart as well, particularly the UDF. We were all active in the UDF. I remember marches with you, Professor Farid Isak, yeah. uh, Imam Hassan Solomon, yes. God rest his soul, uh, and Sharmil Jeppi, and so many people from different uh, faith groups. It was a tremendous, tremendous uh, aspect. And the points you touched on, uh, particularly about the GNU, uh, the accountability aspect uh, are things that we're all concerned about as South Africans. Um, and your extension into the American reference or the, the global reference is also really important because we are a connected world. And I think those are interesting points that uh, we can have further discussions on as we proceed. So thank you for that. Um, there is a minute uh, less than the 15 minutes you were given. So I will give an opportunity for one question. We're not going to necessarily answer it now. If there is a hand, you can you can lift your hand and uh, make your point. Uh, else, we'll go on to the next speaker. 
one going one two and three okay let's go on to our next speaker uh mr shahid bolson there has been a fair introduction uh of yourself uh I'd like to give you the opportunity to add anything more in terms of uh, your own uh, introduction. People in South Africa might not know you that well, other than uh, the, the aspects that you have already touched on, and that is uh, your, your talks have proliferated and touched many hearts and also opened many discussions, uh, including within some of us in the Movement for United South Africa. Uh, and even your perspectives uh, on South African politics as a person who is aware of global uh, uh, political uh, influences has been quite insightful. Um, so over to you, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first, first of all, I'm, I'm absolutely honored to be here. It's, uh, it's really a privilege and uh, I'm, I'm humbled to be, for example, on the panel with Professor Bosak. It's, uh, it's very, uh, truly an honor. Uh, I'm I'm surprised actually that anyone even knows who I am. To be honest, in South Africa, and and I I feel a bit self conscious uh, to talk to such uh, experts or or with such experts to be included among such experts uh, to talk about South Africa. I'm speaking uh, as someone who is not only an outsider but who is acutely cognizant of being an outsider in talking about South Africa. Uh, my perspective is coming from. Uh, the, the 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 three objectives of Middle Nation, which began as as just a channel on YouTube, uh, but then people coalesced around these three objectives that are expressed through Middle Nation and through our content, which is the uh, economic sovereignty, political independence, and psychological decolonization. First of the Muslim world, because we're Muslims, but then of the global South more broadly. Uh, and so this, uh, the content uh, drew people, and it became now uh, a sort of a network or a community uh, of people from all around the world, Muslim and non-Muslim, uh, who are dedicated to these three principles or three, these three objectives. So I'm looking at the situation in South Africa sort of from a view of uh, analyzing what you can say maybe uh, macro trends uh, in the, the overall relationship between the West and the global South, uh, between the West and the Muslim world, between the West and uh, Asia, and between the West and Africa and Latin America and so on. Uh, I can't pretend to speak with uh, any particular uh, expertise on the domestic internal politics of South Africa, uh, except from, as I said, uh, insofar as I can detect uh, the presence of the West in those internal factors. I mean, I, I, I personally have been uh, involved to one in, in, in one way or another, to one degree or another, uh, in critiquing and analyzing and opposing uh, neoliberal colonialism for about a quarter century uh, in writing, in speaking, uh, in activism and so on. Uh, and I'm, I'm only saying that, I'm only uh, mentioning that uh, to say that over the course of these years or decades, I've developed, I guess, a sort of uh, intuitive familiarity with the mechanisms and the tactics and the strategies uh, that they use, that the uh, that that neoliberal colonialism uses uh, in country after country after country, because it's a pattern, it's it's a it's a it's a system that they use, and it's a formula that you, that you can you you learn how to recognize. Uh, and in fact, it's a it's a it's a formula that isn't new. It's a formula, you know, the same way that you have you had colonialism, and then you have neo-colonialism, you had imperialism and neo-imperialism. It's the same formula. It's just tweaked uh, to uh, accommodate uh, current uh, circumstances. Uh, so I'm I'm also speaking as a Westerner, born and raised and indoctrinated in the United States. Alhamdulillah, Islam liberated me from the indoctrination, but I retained uh, an intimate familiarity with my society, with America, with the American thinking, with American ideology, with American approach to the world and American agendas and objectives. Uh, 
So when I look at South Africa, let me let me let me mention something that I I, I talked about recently. There was a book you may be familiar with by uh, a geopolitical analyst George Friedman called The Next 100 Years. And in that book, he was trying to predict what the future looked like, what it might look like in 2100, in the year 2100. Uh, but in the beginning of the book, he talks about uh, what the world looked like in 1900. And then he goes sort of decade by decade by decade at all of the changes that took place in relatively short periods of time between say 1900 and 1940 or 1900 and 1950, the world looked completely different in just a 50 year period. Uh, and by the world, of course, what he means is the West. Uh, England was the center of the world in 1900. London was the center of the world. There was the Ottoman Empire. There was no Soviet Union. There was no communism. 50 years later, the world was completely different. And then you go forward again to the 1980s, then to the 1990s, the 2000s, and so on. You see drastic, radical, paradigmatic shifts uh, in global relationships. Uh, and it's really breathtaking, the, uh, the amount of changes that can take place uh, in one person's lifetime, in one man's lifetime, say, you know, a, a generation, 25 years, 30 years, whatever. Uh, and when you think about that, what's even more breathtaking is when something does not change. When you realize that everything seems to change in the world, then uh, if you see things that do not change, you know that those are deliberately uh, kept the same. They're deliberately maintained. They're deliberately and strictly uh, preserved. This, that, that status quo is deliberately and strictly preserved. And so when you think about that in the context of uh, the West's relationship with Africa, it's quite stunning. Because the West's economic relationship with Africa hasn't changed significantly in 800 years. Not uh, the, 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 the changes that have taken place in, in 10 years within the, within the West uh, can be uh, radical and breathtaking. But, the, but no changes have taken place significantly in the economic relationship between the West and Africa in almost a millennium. That tells you that this is a very entrenched uh, uh, relationship uh, on the side of the West. Uh, maintaining this status quo is absolutely an entrenched uh, uh, paramount priority for the West because this doesn't stay the same by accident. The relationship doesn't stay the same uh, uh, without uh, deliberate intentional uh, policy decisions uh, and dedication and determination to maintain that status quo. So uh, the, the tactics that they use, as I say, will change from time to time. But the point is to understand what their objective is, which is to maintain the exploitation and the subjugation of Africa, because the entire so-called Western civilization is built upon that foundation. They can have nothing of what we regard as the West and what the West regards about itself in terms of it being this, uh, you know, technologically advanced, uh, high income uh, 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 high standard of living and so on, all of that is based upon the uh, exploitation and the subjugation of Africa. There's no way that that can continue without uh, preserving that uh, uh, that status quo. The, uh, the, the means by which they will pursue the maintenance of that status quo, as I say, will change from time to time and circumstance to circumstance. They'll use violence when violence is viable. When violence is not viable, they will use other means, coercive means, manipulation, uh, financial aid, or the promise of financial aid, and obviously loans and debt and so on. And they will use, as I said, uh, some of the same uh, tactics and strategies that they used in the uh, colonial times, the, uh, uh, the, the original uh, colonial times, uh, will continue to be used in neo-colonial times and in neo-imperialistic times. And what you can call now the uh, corporate colonial times, uh, which is the use of local collaborators. They will use local collaborators uh, who will benefit from their collaboration uh, and have a, a similar class affinity with the colonizers, uh, if not uh, a, a similar racial uh, uh, affiliation. They have an ideological affiliation on the basis of class and on the basis of other uh, material interests and so on. Uh, that brings us to the DA, to the so-called Democratic Alliance. Uh, in my view, it's uh, transparently uh, colonialist, colonizer, uh, collaborating uh, political party 
uh, that is exclusively aligned with Western private sector power and the interests of private sector power. It's overtly, uh, in my opinion, radically neo uh, neoliberal in its policies, in its thinking, in its strategy, and unapologetically so. Uh, they have received funding from the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, which is understood correctly as basically a wing of the CIA for uh, uh, funding and uh, fostering uh, opposition groups uh, and groups within any given country in the global south to support uh, American and Western interests. They've been they've been funded by the uh, National Endowment for Democracy. They've been funded by the Open Society Foundation uh, of George Soros, which is uh, I hate to even mention George Soros's name because it's always connected with conspiracy theories. But the fact of the matter is that the Open Society Foundation has been uh, factually connected to uh, involvement in uh, opposition groups uh, in uh, all around the world and and, and uh, helping to support so-called color revolutions. Uh, they've been funded by the uh, Conrad Adenauer uh, Foundation. They've been funded by the Atlantic Council. All of these are neoliberal organizations that promote le neoliberal policies and that promote uh, the interests of uh, Western private sector power. Uh, so there's not a question about their, uh, how can I say, their their ideology and the source of their ideology, that this is, they're, they're plugged into a network uh, of uh, corporate colonizing, neoliberal, parasitic private sector power. They have a very close relationship with the, uh, with the government of Israel. They have a very close relationship with the government of the UK, and they're extremely close to the Americans. I think everyone knows that they have regular meetings at the American embassy, or anyway, they did before they became uh, part of the government. Uh, they have a very, uh, 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 close connection to and access to American officials, American officials in the government. Uh, they have, again, received funding from the NED and then NED subsidiaries like the International uh, Republican Institute, the National, uh, what is it called? The National Democratic Institute, I think it's called. They receive funding from all of these organizations. All of these organizations are neoliberal organizations and all of these organizations uh, have been implicated uh, and incriminated in supporting regime change uh, in uh, global South countries all around the world. Uh, and again, obviously promoting neoliberal policies. So in my opinion, as an outsider, but as someone who has some degree of understanding in how the West operates uh, as an imperial power, as a colonial power, uh, and how the owners and controllers of private sector power, the owners and controllers of global financialized capital, how they have become uh, 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 an empire unto themselves, uh, and the, the new manifestation of colonization and how they operate. As someone who has some degree of familiarity with how they operate, I identify myself, the uh, Democratic Alliance, as absolutely a colonizer, collaborator, political uh, party, a political entity. Uh, and to me, this puts uh, South Africa in a great deal of danger. This puts you in a great deal of danger. This puts uh, any and all uh, advances that have been made post-apartheid uh, in danger of absolute reverse. And of course, it puts all of the uh, the problems that you already have uh, in danger of becoming much, much worse. I mean, we're not in a situation, I, in, in my opinion, South Africa is not in a situation of uh, one step forward, two steps back. You're taking one step forward on a conveyor belt that's going backwards. This is the situation when you have the DA. Uh, in my opinion, the uh, the GNU shouldn't stand for government of national unity. It stands for the government of neoliberal unity, because the ANC, uh, as everyone knows, for the last 30 years or so, has uh, uh, implemented or aligned itself to one degree or another with neoliberal policies, whether they did that out of naivete or whether they did that out of corruption or whether they did that out of coercion uh, or some combination of all of these three. Uh, the fact is that they did uh, pursue neoliberal policies to one degree or another, but compared to the DA, uh, the ANC was neoliberalism light. The, the DA is, is neoliberalism hardcore. And in my opinion, what happened, uh, and again, I'm uh, f uh, fully recognized that I'm an outsider, but this is the way it looks to me from the outside. Uh, the ANC, in pursuing the uh, neoliberal policies, uh, economic and social socioeconomic disasters followed, and predictably, socioeconomic disasters followed 
uh, in South Africa by the implementation of neoliberal policies. Uh, and South Africa is light years away economically from where they should be, where they have every right to be 30 years after the end of apartheid. They should be in a much, much better position than they are today. Uh, it's absolutely, uh, 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 it's ludicrous that 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 uh, South Africa is in the uh, is dealing with the kind of economic socioeconomic problems that they have. There's no excuse for that, in my opinion. Uh, it's a rich country. It's absolutely insane, and and to to be advocating for uh, neoliberal policies in 2024, after 30 years of, of of watching the catastrophic consequences of following neoliberal policies, if you have the nerve to advocate for neoliberal policies in 2024, you have to be either insane or insidious. You have to either uh, actually not understand the connection between neoliberal policies and the socioeconomic devastation that they've caused. Either you have to not understand it, or you have to want it. You have to be in favor of that devastation, which means that you're either uh, too, uh, either you're too incompetent to understand, which means you're too um, incompetent for leadership, uh, or you have too much contempt for your own society, you have too much contempt for your own population to deserve being given a position of leadership. And that's what I see the the, the DA is. And so I think that uh, America and the West understood that uh, the inevitable consequence uh, of pursuing the, uh, the neoliberal policies would cause this devastation because that's all it ever does in any country where it is implemented uh, all it ever does is cause socioeconomic uh, catastrophe. So America and the West understood that this will happen, uh, and they could see also the uh, declining popularity of the ANC as a result of following the policies that the West wanted them to follow. Because this is the way that, that you, you have to understand, this is the way the West uh, approaches politics, the way they approach politicians. You have one they're, minute, they're, Mr. Uh, sorry? You have one minute. Rondo. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I'm talking too much. I didn't even think I could fill 15 minutes. My apologies. Well, uh, well uh, I'll, let me let me just sum it up and say that uh, that I think that that uh, you have to understand that uh, the the GNU is a version of uh, is neoliberalism light and neoliberalism hardcore, and it's united against the population of South Africa and the people of South Africa need to do something about it. But I don't advocate for them to uh, actually view their government uh, as an enemy, uh, even if the government is viewing them and treating them as an enemy. This is still your country, this is still your people, and you can't uh, pursue a change in a way that will create more instability and confrontation and conflict, because that's also something that neoliberalism thrives upon. They will absolutely thrive upon uh, anarchy and chaos and, and problems. And I think that you're going to start to see, and I hope not, inshallah, no, but I think that you're going to start to see even greater crackdowns on civil society, greater crackdowns on activism, greater crackdowns on journalists, uh, now that the DA is uh, is sharing power. Because again, that's something that neoliberalism thrives upon, and it, it provokes, it baits you uh, into lashing out so that it can uh, justify repression and cracking down on, on civil rights and, and, and liberties. So I think uh, that what you're doing here with this dialogue uh, is extremely important. Uh, to, to be able to to come up with uh, uh, ideas and ways of addressing this in a way that is not uh, hostile in, in in its form of confrontation, but trying to negotiate, because that's the way it has to be. Uh, it has to be dealt with through a, a mentality of negotiation, not confrontation, in my opinion. And I'm sorry I talked so much. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much. That was, uh, again, very insightful and uh, ideal for the conversations and dialogues we want to have. Uh, particularly your view on new colonial liberalism and what the mid nation, middle nation uh, entity that you folks have formed. Uh, you know, you mentioned economic sovereignty, you mentioned political decolonization. These are such important aspects for global south. And we in South Africa, uh, within the social media circles, within the civil society uh, movements, within uh, the NGO circles, there's a lot of debate, and in fact, even in political structures about the fact that there is this uh, foreign influence which exploits Africa, exploits South America, exploits Asia, in fact, the whole global South for the benefit of the Eurocentric 20% North, even though the people in the global North uh, seem to be more aligned to the global South positions. Uh, the governments 
seem to be uh, a, a, a real problem. And we see it in the way uh, the United States has vetoed the entire world uh, in, the, in the Palestine issue. So thank you for all those insights. And you also mentioned a few things which I think a few people would be very interested to take up in the discussion. Um, you mentioned the DA particularly. There is this dilemma that if a party in the democratic system has the mandate from people and is voted in, uh, no matter what the influences are, whether they're left, whether they're right, whether they're neo-colonial, they have a right and we play the ball. So I think you uh, alluded to that answer in the end of your statement uh, when you said that it's going to be negotiated and perhaps there's some openings uh, that, that we can pursue further. So we will take up the, the question. There are a couple of questions I should uh, perhaps ask you to have a look at the questions that have been put onto the chat so that in the, in the debate, um, uh, in the panel discussions, we can address them. There's uh, one uh, question from Rashid Motala on uh, how to overcome Western neoliberal methodologies. There's a question from Andre Jacobs on what qualifies, what qualifies the qualities of new, neoliberal policies. We can discuss that further. Uh, what qualifies as neoliberal policies? And uh, a question from uh, uh, Mr. Darius on what is the answer of or solution for South Africa? Is socialism an option? And so on. So have a look at those questions. Zahir Karolia has also put a question. I'm going to ask you to have a look at it in your own time. There's quite a few. Um, and we can have it uh, have some responses in the panel discussion. Uh, let me now go on to our third guest, Tato. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, and you know, we as Musa often um, struggle with the way the world is going. With uh, often we should call it, uh, uh, you know, the male dominant. Aspect of the aspect of having more men and uh, uh, presence of less youth and less women, and Musa has made a considered effort to try and ensure that we we are we are more balanced. But we don't we're still not there. So your presence is an asset for us. Uh, the perspectives that the different genders bring uh, is useful, and uh, your background and uh, uh, introduction that Yusuf gave is phenomenal. So we look forward to your points of view and also your participation in the discussion. Go for it, all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I am quite elated to be on the platform with, with everyone, having listened to those opening remarks by the fellow speakers. One is encouraged that the conversation may just breed us or lead to to actionable solutions, especially for civil society and for concerned South Africans and activists from, from across the spectrum who are present here today. And I'm, I'm gonna pick up from an anecdote um, that I heard a couple of days ago that has stayed with me deeply and one that I've reflected on and tended and tossed about. The leader of the Democratic Alliance, Helen Ziller, said in an in a in a in an interview that their Trump cut as a party in the negotiations over the government of national unity was the South African brand. And she glowingly praised how every time something would go wrong and there would be reports in the media about how the GNU discussions were not progressing positively, the Rand would tank and the DA would celebrate. And using the Rand as a negotiating chip, the DA got its way in those discussions. And this for me has demonstrated in a much more blatant way the need for us to have a, a conversation that is leaning on the reality that capitalism is not interested in socialism, nor is it interested in the democracy that we have built in South Africa over the past 30 years. It's not interested in the views of the majority, which say we seek for there to be a mass democratic revolution. 
what capitalism is interested in is the reinstatement of white power in South Africa. And that has been clear as day since the elections outcome. We have seen how fund managers have been looking forward to this moment of clarity where in their perspective, the presence of the Democratic Alliance, whose leanings and whose posture is not one that we believe is a proponent that would give us the, the South Africa we aspire, that seemingly just demonstrates that capitalism will still be at the heart of the decisions that are made and the kind of reforms that we need to see as a, a people in this country to be able to, to have a government that is not only functional, but one that meets the aspirations of the people in the form of delivering a quality of life may still be miles away because the conversation has moved so swiftly and so subtly from the pursuit of getting rid of poverty, of righting the wrongs of inequality, of dealing with the mass unemployment crisis, to now focus on the pillars that are there for the economic revival that we know as things stand is not bringing forth the kind of reforms that are ideal for a society that is more equitable, but we do, we do so to benefit the few who are concerned with elements such as property rights, with elements such as you know stock market prices, with elements such as investment security. That is not what everyday South Africans are concerned about. In the build-up to the elections, I did extensive work in rural Limbobo and in the informal settlements in Gauteng. And when you sit closer to, to South Africans on the ground, South Africans who do not have access to, for example, the power to organize, and that's something that, you know, during the anti-apartheid struggle was seemingly an easy thing to do, to, to just organize and, and be a part of a collective that pursues the same desires and the same calls that you may be a proponent of, that this, this disconnect and disillusionment, there's, and we've spoken about it for years, I've written about it for years, however, it's getting broader and broader. And when we spoke to people on the ground about what they would like to see as the outcome of the elections, there was a, a reluctance to even lean on a particular political party because as, as I think Dr. Bushak said earlier, there's, there's this trust deficit that we have seen widen over the years between the populace and the politicians. And which is why platforms like these are so important, which is why organizations like this movement that we're building one brick at a time are important. Because only then will people find a space where they feel they can, in fact, learn how to hold government accountable, number one. Number two, how to force government's hand on certain policies that may not necessarily be in the interest of the people. And we, we have seen examples of these um, happen, you know, in, in countries like Kenya, where the young people have taken to the streets. To be able to do that, you must be able to organize. And that's a place where we are lacking in a, in a very, I think, embarrassing way for a country with such a, a deep and meaningful history of organizing. Now, coming back to, to the question of, of capitalism versus what we'd like to see in a democracy. And I saw someone asking the, in the chat, you know, what is what is our solution? Is socialism the solution? I've moved beyond past um, the, the ideological debate because the ideological debate says this is a box, fit in this box. I've now come to a place where I say, when we analyze the material conditions of the day, when we analyze the actual you know, physical prison that has entrapped the hopes of people, that has entrapped the ability of people to be able to make something meaningful of their lives in the form of, for example, just being able to be employed. At the heart of it, comes it comes down to the capitalist system. And the capitalist system is so entrenched and so organized and so systemic 
that even how Helen Zilla describes the Trump cut of the DA being the rand and being the market's reaction to the election outcome, that speaks directly to the function of capitalism in our society. And we speak on these platforms today as a result of the information age, which is at its heart is advancing the, the, the need of capitalism to create and create in order to hold us more and more imprisoned. So if we can't get rid of capitalism, what can we do? And if we, we, we are you know, committed to pushing this agenda of, at the end of the day, realizing better lives for all, and ensuring that our country, you know, riches can materialize and, and be beneficial to everyone who lives in it. How do we do so alongside capitalism? And that's, that's why I want to talk about organizing. And I want to talk about the role of civil society in the government of national unity. There's a, a backseat position that a lot of civil society organizations have taken in the wake of, of the GNU instead of doubling our efforts, instead of teaching every South African how it is that we can group ourselves and challenge specific policies, challenge specific laws, which is an ability we have, which is something that we, we hold dear when we say we are in a democratic state. Yet, the voices that will come in when, for example, a bill is published for public comment will be sponsored voices of the very capitalist system. There will be workshopped ideas and workshop positions that are manufactured by the very system to go and either bolster this existing proposal in, in, the, in the form of a legislation or to pretend to take away from it while presenting within it another element that still holds the people of this country back. Now, if we organize in a way that is comprehensive, that is coordinated, and that is not along any other line, but the line that says we are civil society and what we want is better living conditions for all South Africans. And we know that those will come in this, that, and that form. Only then will we be able to, to make some form of a dent on the system as is. I'm very reluctant that the government of national unity will bring anything positive for everyday South Africans. And my pursuit is, is for those people. My interest is, in how a 70-something-year-old woman sitting in Zanspreit in, in the west of Johannesburg is, is able to not only have access to, to clean drinking water, but feel safe in the space where they live, where they feel that their voice matters and their voice is heard, where when we go back to them during the work we will be doing ahead of the local government elections, they will not still sit, be sitting in the same place that says that I am not a part of this project and I'm not a part of this democracy. And that's where we all come in. And it does not, it does not take as much as, as we somehow imagine. And that's why the ideological conversation is always for me quite tough. Because when you when you speak to everyday South African South Africans, the first question they ask you when you show up in a community is not what is your ideological outlook? they could not be bothered. What they seek to establish is how do we move from where we are to a better place. When you speak to young people in South Africa, they do not care for your political ideology, nor where your your your, your sponsored, as you know, the big debate is now about civil society, there's this clash in civil society where you know Musa says I can't speak to Rivonia Circle, Rivonia Circle says, I can't speak to Sanko, Sanko says, I can't speak to whoever. Yet all of these formations exist for supposedly the same purpose. And when we go to the ground, no one asks under whose umbrella you've come and why you are here. What they're interested in is how do you empower me? How do you empower our community to organize better? to be able to hold government accountable, 
to be able to push for the kind of change that we want to see. South Africa was just one of 70, 73 countries in the world that went out to elections this year. And in where we are in, in geopolitical terms is, is not very far off from the kind of shifts that we've seen. For example, in India, where Prime Minister Modi's party had to, for example, go into a coalition out of the, the, the election outcome. We saw what happened, you know, where there's the clear, you know, definition of positions Taiwan in Taiwan. Taiwanese have decided that they in fact want to, to go with a more American aligned leader. Of course, that worsens the tension in, in the South China Sea and introduces a whole lot of dynamics in that area. And we we are always gonna see the, the usual trends that we see, yet we saw how people in France rose against what would have been a, an ultra right leader whose messaging was rooted in, in division and whose messaging was rooted in separating you know, the ideals and the common vision of, of a society. Now, we are in the same boat in the fact that South Africans have said, we don't like where we are going, but we don't trust anyone enough to be able to, to hold our kitty by themselves. Unfortunately, the outcome was what it was in the GNNG and U negotiations. And the outcome will continue to shock us going forward. We've seen already as, as is where we have different one, one minutes minute to round off settle. Sorry, one minute to round off. Advocating, advocating for, for different ideals. And we we see once more how, for example, the Patriotic Alliance. Minister uh, Gates and Mackenzie says, you know, we, we cannot be talking about the the Israel issue, the fact that Israel is at the Olympics and wanted to make a stance about, about it. So again, we are not, there, there is no linear or there is no coordinated, there is no single united vision for where we go, but it can only come out of civil society. I'll speak there. I'll stop there rather. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Fato. And that uh, that perspective on, on capital currency and, and uh, the grassroots poverty aspect that you touched on uh, is, is so crucial to all of us. You know, we, we do discuss ideologies, we do discuss influences, and uh, at Musa, we always talk about uh, the ground, the, the grassroots, how often, uh, uh, you know, are we addressing their issues? And you touched on it again, you know, the aspect of poverty, which exists up to now, even after 30 years of uh, independence from apartheid, uh, freedom and equality is supposed to have set in, but we still have inequality, uh, employment issues, and so much more. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I think the questions you can see coming through as well uh, concur with many of the points that all three of you have spoken about, and some of them challenging you as well, questioning uh, aspects and seeking clarity. Uh, I encourage you all to look at those uh, as we progress to the next stage of our uh, program, which is going to be uh, at least discussion between the three of you. I'm sure you also have uh, points and questions that you've noted for each other. So we'd like to give you the chance to uh, talk to that. Uh, and if at the same time it addresses the points that are on the chat, we can, we can address those. Uh, I can give uh, one of our Musa folks and an opportunity to assist me by reading some of the questions. Um, Iqbal, Yusuf, Karuna, would any of you like to do that? All right, it looks like- uh, Faisal, I think, uh, yeah, you, you have covered a few of the questions. Mm earlier um but there was a question um by Jose Tsile, uh is asking brother Shahid uh, being a public servant the degree to which anarchy is being promoted is scary uh, those that do wrong are encouraged and those that try to do right are dealt with harshly um Another question also, how do those in the public service navigate this environment? Uh, so I think those are important questions because whilst there's the political and 
angle to the whole government of national unity. In the end of the day, you know, the public service and government will still will still move along in terms of its own momentum and policies and programs and the political environment will be interpreted into programs of action into government and public servants will be you know responsible for for navigating that uh, and how do they actually guard uh, and 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 work according to it so i think that question is is you know relating relating to that um, um. Can, can, I'm sorry. Uh, can yeah. you can you read the first part of that question again? I didn't catch it about the public uh, servants. Yeah, it says the degree to which anarchy has been promoted. Uh, it says being a public servant, the degree to which anarchy is being promoted is scary. Those that do wrong, I encourage those that try to do right, that dealt with harshly. I think this is influence that's been brought to bear on public servants in terms of, when, uh, you know, uh, undertaking their work in a professional manner. Can I can I say something about that? Yeah, sure. I think, Basil. Yes, we can uh, now go on to the uh, discussion between the three of you and also addressing the questions uh, from the chat group. Please have a look at it uh, yourselves as well. There's quite a few. So yes, uh, let's start with you, uh, Shai. Go for it. Uh, well, just uh, I, I would just say with regards to uh, what that comment was, or what the question was, or the observation really about. I, I assume this is from his own, uh, his or her own per, uh, personal experience, maybe working in the public sector. Uh, that it's basically the uh, effective uh, performance of your job, effective. Um, Public, effective public service is being undermined and uh, ineffective public service is probably being promoted because this, again, is part of uh, how neoliberalism works. The whole, the whole uh, point of it uh, is to shift uh, power from the public sector to the private sector. So you want to undermine. This is how it operates uh, everywhere. And it's also operating that way, by the way, in the West itself, where uh, government uh, they need government to be ineffective. They need government to be inefficient uh, because they want to, for one of the reasons why, is because they want to encourage uh, uh, and, and almost necessitate privatization of all government services. So they want the government to be inefficient and ineffective at uh, providing the services that they're supposed to provide so that then they can, they can, they can uh, create a demand for the privatization, or rather not even create a demand, but a rationalization uh, create a rationalization for the privatization of those services, uh, saying that the private sector can be more efficient and can be more effective, and trying to also uh, create more and more distrust and mistrust uh, and and uh, lack of faith uh, and lack of expectations in what the government can and and uh, is able to do for you. The whole point is to is to uh, undermine the government because the government's only job uh, in the neoliberal model is to basically sell everything, uh, all services, all uh, uh, functions of the government to the private sector. So this is, this is I mean, what you're talking about ref reflects that. Thank you for that input. Uh, uh, Dr. Busak, would you like to weigh in? Yes, thank you. I, um, uh, I'm very encouraged by the way in which uh, all three of us, and that I can see from the questions as well, as much as I could see, I couldn't see, um, I, I saw only a little bit, and then the type disappears with me. But you will, you will remind us of those questions. But I'm encouraged by what I see is a consensus in these conversations that we're having this afternoon about the fundamental issues that are at stake here. Uh, fundamental, in the sense that it also are the fundamentals on which this government of national unity is built. For instance, the question of new liberal capitalism and the key role that must continue to play. The question of a decision, which way in the global shift, tectonic plate shift that we are experiencing, this country is supposed to go. Um, and so that to me is important. Um, my sister Tertu talked about that when you go to the communities, People are not interested in sort of what political ideological point of view you represent. Uh, and that is true. 
On the other hand, there are two things that I think we cannot uh, miss here. One is that the fragmentation that our politics has become over the last 30 years is reflected in the fragmentation that we now find in civil society. And so that's one part of the difficulties of bringing people together around understanding some fundamental issues that still bind us together. It really doesn't matter uh, whether you, your political affiliation is one thing, your, your life's reality and experience makes you see something different and that brings people together. So that is also true. The other consensus that I have found is last year, uh, from the Church Society here in Cape Town, we published a declaration. And uh, in one of the first paragraphs of that declaration about the situation in our country that we describe as a crisis and as one of the necessities to bring us together to have a new kind of national conversation about where we are and where we're going, is that we noticed and mentioned new liberal capitalism, uh, the necessity of new liberal capitalism to have social inequalities, to have high unemployment, to have weak uh, um, uh, trade unions, those kinds of things, uh, and to have a weak social cohesion so that those at the top can even better control and rule and harm those at the bottom and take for themselves what belongs to the community. So, but there is a consensus that came out of churches. And when I discuss those, issues with civil society organizations that are not religious civil society organizations that are trade unions. Those are one of the things that they simply said, yes, absolutely, this must be a point of discussion as we go forward. It must also be a point of mobilization. So I'm saying that even though there has been fragmentation and even though people have turned to sort of inward in many ways, there are already identifiable points of consensus around which mobilization can take place. And one of the things that also mobilizes people is that there is a growing lack of confidence in this government of national unity. That gives people an opportunity to say, oh, look at what is presented as unity is in fact, the unity of a small clique that benefits from this, but they have no concern whether that fosters unity for society as a whole. So I'm thinking there are many more things that are surfacing as this debate goes on and that opens up possibilities for mobilization. And may I just end this section of my participation by saying I'm one of those people who believe that this government of national unity is not good for South Africa. No. It's not good for our people. It's good for all sorts of other people outside this country and inside this country. It's not good for our people. It doesn't serve the well-being of people. And so one of the things that I think we must do is to find creative ways of putting pressure on this government of national unity. Holding them accountable is one way of putting pressure, making sure that the people's voices are united, mobilized, and heard in the street. As another one, making sure that there is an alternative voice that arises in this ongoing conversation, because there are calls for a national conversation, but those calls are calls that mean for a national conversation that gives legitimacy to the government of national unity and whatever programs it come up with. And I believe that there ought to be an alternative voice so that the progressive voices in South Africa can be more united and more pronounced and more activated. Thank you. And that would be a great thing if we could get to that point. Appreciate that. Uh, Thato, your perspective on this? Please unmute yourself. I wanted to, to touch on a question that comes back to whether, I think it's the Zahir um, who asked the question in the chat around whether the GMU would be a win for, for capitalism if South Africa was better off. And the answer is, is it, it would still be a win for capitalism because capitalism can never have enough. It's, it's, it's a system entrenched in greed and the, that greed can never say, I've had, I've had it, this is enough, this is enough wealth, this is enough ownership of land I can share. 
capitalism does not do that. It, it can only take and take and take. Yeah. Now, what, what I project is going to happen is that South Africa will see increased investment in coming months for as long as the GNU is intact. Simply because, again, capitalism wants to prove that it wants the DA to be in charge mm -hmm. and to have a, a greater and significant role in not only the economy, but society at, at large. There's going to be, obviously, the stimulation of economic growth as a result. And all of us are going to celebrate because, for example, there's already a conversation that the South African Reserve Bank will be cutting interest rates um, way ahead of, of the Americans. And this is something that we, we are going to see be credited to the GNU immediately. And what will not be the conversation when that happens is that none of these these riches that we'll see as, as a result of this economic re revitalization, none of them are gonna lead to inclusive growth. What we are pursuing as civil society, what we are pursuing, pursuing as any rational person who wants to live in a healthy society is inclusive growth. What will happen is that this, this growth will benefit only the capitalist segment of our economy and of our country. And the level of inequality that we have will simply broaden. We've seen this happen in many other democracies where the outcome has been what it is. Will there be improved governance and accountability? Maybe. Simply because the electorate has taught the government in the form of the ruling party of, of, of our, our past that they are able to take away their votes from them if the time nor all the need arises. However, that will not immediately be credited to the electorate. That win is going to be credited again to the DA, simply because the narrative in South Africa is not driven by the majority. Narrative is not driven by the voices of, for example, those who sit on the fringes of society, unable to determine whether they are left or right. It's not determined in those spaces. Narrative is, is determined by those who fund mass media. And there's a conversation that I hope civil society can start having. We've seen in, in these past few weeks, consistent reportage from News24, whose foundations of course need not be delved into because I believe everyone understands its posture, where it's become blatantly clear that there is a very well-coordinated strategic, strategic campaign to promote the idea that DA ministers are superior in performance, in effectiveness, in response time, in, in knowledge, in education, in anything that, that says better than. So all of these wins that we are going to see in, in coming months, should the GNU hold, will not go exactly where they should go. And even when the work, and as a result of all of these shifts, in how South Africans relate with democracy, given the amount of, of work that is happening in the grassroots consistently by organizations such as yours. It will not be credited to that. Everything will be credited to the GNU and the GNU's sort of center hold will be placed as the DA. And even when you enter spaces, I, I do consultations with, with some countries out of you know, our continent and the, every conversation they that they want to have is the question, how long would the GNU last and what is the possibility of the ANC continuing with any other partner but the DA? And that sort of determines where people put their money. Because right. again, we, we may want to, to imagine that democracy and our pursuit of non-racialism has landed us in a better place there's still a portion of the world and that portion controls a lot of every you know sphere of, of power base in our societies, which is interested in white power and white power married to neoliberalism and that's what it is. I'll pause there for now, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, very interesting points coming and surfacing. Clearly there's um, an opportunity for us to not just negatively brand the GNU as somebody that can work with. I think, Dr. Busak, you mentioned um, uh, some ideas of getting more civil society involved um, and uh, accountability. Uh, 
And I think uh, that you've also talked about the importance of uh, uh, you know, the narrative, which so often is um, in the hands of those who seem to be more neoliberal than anything else, um, and giving lots of credit to the side that's not really necessarily the one that is all deserving of the credit, and um, that dilutes the measures and the benefits. So what I'd like to also uh, touch on, and perhaps not me touch on, but really give you an opportunity to touch on as, as the three panel speakers in the next uh, uh, 10 minutes or five minutes before we go on to question and answer from everybody else, is maybe concluding points on um, your perspectives for the solution. If the GNU is a problem, uh, you know, what is the solution? If uh, neoliberalism neo is a problem, what is the solution? Uh, th these realities face us today as South Africans. Uh, what are the steps we can take to gain and benefit and play the game, if we may call it that, of overcoming uh, the negative forces with more positive forces, forces, with more people pushing towards greater good, irrespective of the ideologies? and to be cautious and aware of external factors influencing things uh, and doing to Africa and South Africa what they've been doing uh, through for, for many decades, in fact, centuries, uh, through, the, through the colonial empires and now the existing empire in which the economics, uh, the central banks, the currencies are still in the hands of uh, the Eurocentric minor minority. Uh, and Shahid Bolson, you touched on some of these aspects in your talk. I think. Uh, I'd like to just give you all uh, perhaps two minutes to make your concluding comments before we take on questions from the floor. Um, over to you, Shahid. Okay. Um, in, in, in my opinion, well, for, first, I, I wanted to comment something about that with, with regards to narrative and regards to the fact that um, the narrative is controlled by the people in power uh, and that they will uh, present this idea that the that the DA or the GNU is very effective and very uh, uh, successful. Uh, there's there's a degree to which narrative control is slipping from the hands of power, uh, and I think that this what we're doing right now is an example of that. Uh, I think that social media has opened up a lot of uh, avenues for alternative narratives, and the the uh, I won't even say the creation of of a narrative, but the expression of the reality that is denied by the official narrative that you can see uh, across social media. So uh, I think that that uh, things like what we're doing today, and I think that uh, I, I've interacted with a number of, of, of uh, South African uh, content creators and so on, who are presenting a, a very different view and a very, uh, I would say, it's a different view because it's the the, the view of reality rather than a narrative. They're actually talking about the reality on the ground in South Africa and the way people feel and the way people think uh, and what they're experiencing. And that is being expressed. It's just not in the official media, uh, not in the uh, what, what would generally be regarded as the state-controlled media. I don't know the extent to which you would regard it as that in South Africa, but the, 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 the interests of power that control a certain narrative even those narratives uh, are losing the trust and and uh, of the people. The people now, I think, all around the world are increasingly distrusting and dismissive of official narratives that are being given to them. Uh, so I think that that that's a, a good uh, a, a good development, uh, which is a difficult thing for the for those in power to manage. They haven't quite figured out how to uh, suppress uh, the social media. Uh, uh, the, the narratives that that exist on social media and the discussions and the dialogues that that uh, and expressions of, of of views and expressions of reality and representations of reality that that you can find on social media they haven't quite found a way to suppress that and probably the best example of that is the situation in Gaza and the genocide in Gaza that uh, you know 30 years ago they would have completely uh, suppressed that and people wouldn't know actually the reality of what's happening so uh, that's that's an important thing. Um, with regards to uh, moving forward and how to deal with uh, the GNU, in my opinion, as I said, I think that uh, it should be regarded as as a, a colonial regime, 
uh, that you have now, you have you have uh, the neoliberalism uh, light of the ANC, you have the neoliber neoliberalism hardcore of the DA, and you have no other side represented. So they've shifted the discourse all the way over to the extreme side uh, of neoliberalism, uh, and they've defined by by doing that you shift what the middle ground is, so that even the middle ground uh, is. Uh, even if they have any sort of a concession or they can make any sort of a gesture uh, of uh, not being neoliberal or, or make any sort of a gesture to actually the public good and public welfare and what the people want, uh, that concession will still end up being on the on the spectrum of neoliberalism because they've shifted it so far to the to, to that side. Uh, so I think that uh, civil society and and uh, social media and what you can sort of call almost informal organizing between people uh needs to try to shift uh more to the other side i won't necessarily say to a socialist side or what have you but that that will depend domestically on what the what the situation is what the general feelings are uh on the ground in south africa which i can't say i'm aware of uh but the the the, the spectrum of discourse has been shifted so far to the neoliberal side that another side has to be represented now to a certain extent it's represented by parties like the eff uh, that are very much on the polar opposite side uh from the neoliberal side and i think that that helps in, in terms of uh making the middle ground more actually the middle ground rather than a fake middle ground that's actually all the way over to the right uh it, it does you. help to have another point Thank you for the for that summation and also uh, the, the the emphasis on the narrative, which we we do have a concern about. Uh, the, the the EFF and the MK, the Nkonto Sizwe Party, um, are not in the GNU, and uh, that is an issue which 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 I think um, a lot of us have been concerned about because the government of national unity should be national unity inclusive of all. Uh, as, we, as we were saying earlier also, everyone in parliament has a mandate from the people and everyone should be working for the people. That's what the intention was. But just uh, to let you know, a lot of people in South Africa, uh, especially those inclined towards the EFF and MK, uh, have said similar things to what you have said about uh, the foreign agenda, the neoliberal agenda, uh, the need for independence from uh, the global north, the problem of currency and uh, central banks, which are exploiting and, and funding a neoliberalism, even in South Africa, through uh, entities like the DA, as you alluded to, or in fact, as, as you directly stated. Uh, Dr. Busak, you, you know, uh, many people have said, just like MK, uh, the UDF, if the UDF stood as a party with faces like yourself and others, uh, you would have got even more than what uh, the MK and EFF have got. <laughs> and we wouldn't have this problem today. So it's a pity you didn't do that or the D, uh, UDF uh, uh, Star Wars didn't go ahead and do that because there is so much of respect for what the UDF, UDF did. Um, I, I'd like to give you a two minutes that way and then we go back to Adam. Well, uh, I, I mean, I, okay. I, shouldn't use, I shouldn't use my two minutes. Uh, I can simply wait for, for the people who are with us to pose their questions directly. Simply to say though, that the thing of the narrative is crucially important. Um, but just to note that the official narrative may be the dominant narratives in their media. It is not always the dominant media amongst our people. And that is what we should exploit in the good sense of the word. And that is what I keep on saying, let us create an alternative space for the alternative voices to be heard. And when you have those voices united enough and strong enough, I guarantee you there is no way that the government of national unity with all of their media support, with all of their money backing can afford to ignore what is because in a sense, a government of national unity, this is not a government of national unity, and maybe we should not have such a thing as a government of national unity, and maybe we should just let the different ideologies compete with one another and see which gets the, the favor of the people in an election. But that is one thing. But the point that I think we should be making right now before we go to the conversation 
is that create that space for people to come together, to speak, and to be sure that they can take back their power and be confident in that what they say and what they do as it manifests itself in whatever way, even protesting the street, that that is what the government of national unity cannot ignore because in a contradictory sense, they depend on capital and those who have the capital, but they cannot do without the confidence of the people. And that contradiction is what we should fo focus on. Sure, agreed. Thank you for that. In fact, it, uh, it's, it also overlaps with what uh, uh, Shai Bolson was saying, that the narrative is more and more uh, flipping over from the mainstream um, almost owners of media. So th that's, that's all possible. And in fact, we're seeing a lot of it happening, uh, despite what, uh, what comes through from, uh, from, from national media and uh, the owners of media. There are lots and lots of different opinions being expressed uh, by civil society and even on the streets. Uh, Theater, over to you in your last two minutes before we go to the rest of the conversation with the, uh, with the participants on board. A short one. So the way that civil society functions has to have a new element to it. And that is some sort of an incubation hub for innovative solutions. Because as old as, as the challenges that we confront sound, confront sound, they have manifested new ways of, of existence and they, they do not move in the same way that, that we know. Yet civil society still mm -hmm. use the same method for mobilization and organizing. I implore, I implore Musa, I implore activists on the platform to to start spending a bit more time looking at how to harness new ideas, especially from younger people who have managed to, to excel at finding newer ways of communicating messages, finding newer ways of penetrating spaces where civil society would not necessarily in the past have had a footing. There's a conversation about how we, we use, for example, information information management. And that's that's just some of the innovations that we need to see happen in civil society, where the conversations that we ought to be having on platforms like these reach thousands and thousands of people. And all of that is possible and it can be done if there's, there's a, a very intentional and innovative method of going about it. Because at the end of the day, unless if we mobilize, unless if we organize, then there's, there's no impact that civil society can have in policy influence, for example, in building the kind of society that, that we aspire for. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tato. In fact, uh, you've now given us advice on uh, what to do as next steps as well. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask the Musa, uh, a lot of the Musa members, uh, well, at least half a dozen of them are on board today, to please follow up with you and Bring you on board that for, for the organizing part of things because you are emphasizing on that and i think uh we need that we are all volunteers at musa no one's employed uh full time we are we are we are committed members of uh, society trying to do whatever we can in in the small way we can in the time we have uh, so we uh, we encourage all of you to, to join us in this effort uh, and the encouragement from all of you is very positive uh, we will try and take it up with you further I would like to now get straight on to the next side of the panel uh, of the discussion. Uh, and I see, I see a couple of hands up already. So as we're going to those hands, can I please ask uh, Yusuf and Iqbal to uh, group together some of the questions that are on the chat. Uh, and uh, after the, the hands that are up, we will uh, take your summary of those questions uh, and put it to the floor. So let's start with Abu Karolia. Please go ahead, Abu. Uh, thank you, Chair Faisal. Uh, thank you to the speakers. I've been amazed at all of your talks. Uh, and my question will come from a position that I say that if we correlate your views today and bring it in a coherent view, all of you have set a process of what is it that we need to do in our country in what is so real. To be aware in a way that, uh, that uh, uh, Professor Alan Busak has talked about civil society processes 
and Dr. Shahid Bolson talking about no no rebel positions that is externally uh, involved in our local politics. And then we got Tato that talks about the people on the ground of what they are expecting of what is required, the new processes that is in place. Now, my position is such that I would like to say that some people in the critique of Musa say that when we talk of Musa's ethos, which demands transformation, driven by, and I'm saying it, active morality and ethics, to restore values and dignity for our people. And then we work towards a transformative conscious movement. We value this dignity and this particular apathy that tells us that I must come to the real world, that how can we talk of morality and ethics and concept of consciousness and active position of restoration of values, of a new paradigm in economy. Why am I talking about not understanding the real world? The real world is in power and they don't understand morality and ethics. And the, my view is such that we are allowing that kind of view to be almost retarding our view of activism to the point that we actually do need a new model based on not just local governance or local transit of conscious movement, but we need it now in the world. I don't think we should be rhetorically just dealing with the position of the GNU or rhetorical in terms of what is the international view that we have at the position of power. We need to engage them with a solution finding way. And I'm saying that if we need a civil society which engages all relevant persons that can establish capable and ethical governments of meritocracy, develop a, a developmental state in South Africa, and an economy that will eradicate the concerns that we have, and we know them, poverty, unemployment, and racism, and bringing the dignity. But this is not only in the context of South Africa. I speak to Alan Busak, I speak to uh, Shahid Bolson in the first name principles, and I speak to Teto, that we have to make this a new world in relative to what that means. Musa's task at the next level is to engage faith-based communities, is to engage youth and then business. We need your help and we need to help you to develop the civil society and keep the eye on the ball so that we are not eroded by the agendas and the subaltern views that they are too happy to see in the terms of eccentric position, Eurocentric or otherwise, but now to develop an element of being human of the basis of what we are now going to progress. What do the speakers say about that? Unmute, Faisal. Thank you, Karuna. Uh, let's go on to, thank you, Abu. Uh, let's go on to the other, other hand that's up. Andre Jacobs, please. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I just have a quick question for Dr. Bolson. Um, how, how important is BRICS to the, to the future of South Africa? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, let's take it. The, uh, the, we'll take all the hands that are up at the moment, which are four. Uh, to Melo Pizzo, please go ahead. No, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, revolutionary greetings, uh, everyone. Uh, what a very uh, interesting topic indeed. Uh, a thought-provoking one and uh, a very relevant uh, topic. Uh, my my take on the topic is that the, the GNU, uh, I think, is the salvation that we have been waiting for for a very long time. <laughs> considering that uh, those who, who, who felt that uh, in the previous uh, administrations, they were marginalized. I think right now, GNU is inclusive of uh, a very uh, important uh, uh, organizations. I mean, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, organizations that are taking place uh, in the GNU. And uh, I think uh, this... Uh, this is a very uh, step in the in the right direction. This is a progressive uh, a step uh, because uh, everyone is going to be included in the decision making. And uh, I think uh, uh, considering that uh, uh, the GNU is a 
is 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 one that is uh, going to 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 lead uh, this uh, seventh administration. I know that uh, 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 there's going to be a a a challenges that are going to be there. Uh, in the GNU, but I think we are going to go over, over, overcome the challenges. And uh, 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 if you compare it with, uh, I know that uh, uh, one country, uh, Lesotho, Lesotho is is uh, running their uh, state uh, in a GNU uh, method. So I know um, our our president uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, when there when there was uh, challenges uh, over there to resolve those challenges because there was an impasse. Uh, but I think on our side, uh, we are going to uh, overcome the challenges that are going to come with the GNU. And, uh, Thank you, Camelo, so, for your view. Yes, uh, as I conclude, uh, as I conclude, um, yes, let's uh, support uh, this uh, government. And um, it's, it's a very uh, good uh, government. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Tumelo. Uh, Surya, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank, thank you so much, Faisal. I just want to say <laughs> to me, uh, Tato, to, to Melo, you spoke about the GNU. I agree with you totally because that's what we worked on with the Women's Elective Mechanism for Peace, and, and that's great. However, when we talk to the grassroots and the ordinary people and the, what's the name, everyone is caught up with the OPM, the OPM. The opium is in relation to the drugs, but all the children, when we engage with them, it is about what does OPM really stand for other people's money? So we want to work, we want to get activities, we want to create, ensure that we have grassroots people to, to have the minimum wage. And it has been a difficult journey to fight for the minimum wage and to finally have it accepted at the at government level. Yes, so the seventh parliament is going to be amazing. And yes, Tumelo, it is going to work because the faith-based organizations are organizing and women are coming forward to ensure that we build a society with regard Malcolm to the South. morality and the... Sorry. ANC. Pardon? Abu, you might want to mute yourself. Go ahead, uh, so yeah, please start round off the question. Okay, so the, uh, that that is with regard to the OPM. The OPM is about other people's money, and we always caught up with this thing about having our country in, going into debt. We paid for the apartheid debt. We paid it off to clear our books to make sure we didn't have a problem. So Zala mustn't come with her chamors that she okay. talks about because she was in the civil society. She engaged on the basis. She's a journalist. She knows how to push the buttons. And people mustn't be triggered with the buttons that she pushes. They must not fall for that trigger because the National Action Plan for Women, Peace and Security, we are committed as South African women in dialogue to make sure our country is safe. I thank you. Thank you. Um, with, with the permission of the panelists, I'm going to take uh, the last uh, two hands that are there and then give you all an opportunity to, to respond and also make your closing remarks in, in the interest of time. And at the end of the session, our chairperson, uh, Karuna Mohan, will... Uh, close the session, round up, and uh, discuss next steps. So um, it's three ends. Uh, yeah. Okay. Shamila, please go ahead. Thank you, Shukran. Um, I would like to disagree with my comrades that just spoke. Now, I don't see how this GNU can work when your ideology and your policies are very different. The playing fields was never leveled. We never had as, um, and I'll put it bluntly, as non-white South Africans, we never had economic freedom. There was no social justice. We had to be apologetic about being non-white, but our white counterparts never felt that they should apologize to us. So where do you run a, a government, if you want to call it a coalition or unity, when the playing fields are not leveled and we all are disadvantaged. So who will have the advantage when you're sitting there, right, in this national union and you know that you're on the back foot? 
because majority of our people in this country are black, right? Disadvantaged, living in poverty, social ills. So where is the, the level, when is it going to happen to level those playing fields? Because you, the DA, sorry, lastly, sorry, Faisal, just one last thing. They're going yeah. to look after their interests, the people that voted for them, corporates and majority white citizens of this country. And I think we must stop shying away from the fact that we had political freedom to vote, but we did not have the freedom to live a dignified life. Thank you. Thank you, Sharmila, for, for those points. Uh, please go ahead, ready. Uh, thank you, Chair. In fact, uh, I'll be very brief. I already put my question on the chat. Uh, it's quite obvious our presenters were or are, are against the government of national unity. I just want to know what are the alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. Very valid uh, question. And uh, lastly, Mwalima Fakuda, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, indeed. Oh. Indeed, the playing field was never leveled and it's still not level up to now. What we need to do as South Africans is to ensure that civil society is the one that gives the mandate to the government of national unity, failing which there isn't any government of national unity. We can see the upheavals right now. Yesterday, we had Helen Zeller saying there is no government of national unity. Someone within government is saying that to us. So we need to mobilize on the ground. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Mualima. Um, well, we we now in the final stage of our, our session and uh, we've got uh, about 10 minutes left. I'd like to give uh, each of the speakers two minutes to respond and then uh, close with our chairperson uh, of Musa, our chair lady from Musa, to uh, round off and take us into the next step. So let's start with uh, Tato first. Uh, uh, please go ahead, Tato. Thank you so much. At the end of the day, South Africa is one of the most beautiful countries in the world, and we are enriched with so much. We are a people of hope. We are a people of determination. And when we, we come together around a common vision, we have seen what can happen. And my only message to every activist and every South African on this platform is to be intentional about your fight for South Africa, the South Africa that you want. And I believe that in this context, we all want a South Africa that everyone or one of us can have a quality of life within. And that can only happen through active citizenry. Let's be more active. For every bill that is published, let's form little committees and interrogate them. For every policy that is being proposed, let's form little committees and little, little societies in our communities and interrogate them. Where submissions must be made, where public comments must be made, let's make our voices heard. Because at the end of the day, the future of this country rests on our shoulders. And I do not believe, as I sit here, that the answer for that future is the GNU in its current format. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Busak, let's go to you. Are you on mute, Dr. Busak? I apologies for that. Um, I want to say to Abu that what you ask, uh, what you stand for in Musa is absolutely what we stand for. What I find people around the country are coalescing around. And what you ask for, that we join hands and that we do this thing together is what we are already doing. At this moment, I am in conversation with different people from the faith communities, groups we're meeting next Monday um, to follow up on our previous conversations. And we will do this thing because all of us are clear. This government of national unity is an imposition. It is not 
what we people, what our people wanted, what we need, what will take this country forward. I agree with those who say we have to find something different. You cannot have a government of national unity when the vast majority of voters who have voted are now excluded because of a coalition between two major parties that are basically the same in their policies that are detrimental to the majority of our people. So that's where we are. And we will have to work to make people understand, number one, what the situation is that they already know. Number two, that we can still mobilize them in various different ways with the new ideas that Teto is talking about. And number three, that it is up to us whether this country goes in the wrong or in the right direction, taking the power back that we know that we have in making this happen is what I think we should dedicate ourselves to. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Busak. Over to you, Shahid. Okay, one, I, I would address one thing, which was about BRICS. I think that the uh, the rise of BRICS and the, all of the, the, the hopes and ambitions that are connected with BRICS and the, the real possibilities and potentialities that are connected with BRICS is precisely why you have the situation now in South Africa that you have and why the United States and why the West was supporting the DA to begin with because they wanted to secure uh, their neoliberal uh, colonial control over South Africa because it was in danger. Uh, South Africa was, uh, there was a threat that South Africa could actually become economically sovereign and politically independent with the rise of BRICS. So they had to make moves very quickly to ensure that that wouldn't happen. They have to get their, uh, their uh, colonial agents basically in, in control to secure, as I said, that millennium long status quo that they have been uh, preserving all of these years all of these centuries. Uh, so BRICS is a very hopeful thing. It, it, it's a, it, has, it, it holds a lot of promise uh, and that's a promise for us and risk and threat to them. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, BRICS is, in, is extremely important, which is one of the reasons why the DA is against BRICS. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, it, it, this is precisely why, because how can I say this? You have now a window of opportunity presented by by BRICS and the rise of the global south and the fact of the uh, pivot of the global economy to the global south, uh, which is an inevitability. That's something that's going to happen either way, whether you're able to manage the transition or not, or whether you come up uh, on the uh, on the winning end of that or not, uh, is depends on what you do and how you deal, for example, with the situation in South Africa and with the situation with the DA and the so-called GNU. And I think that you should look at... Uh, this government of national unity, as I said, government of neoliberal unity, this is like a, a, a unity in the same way that a, a, not all unities are good, Yanni. The, 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 uh, a tumor is united with your body, and that's not a good thing. You need to separate them. Uh, cancer is united with the body, and it needs to be surgically removed. So I think that what you need to do uh, with, with regards to the DA uh, is to uh, lobby against them as much as you can and sever that group, sever that party from the government uh, and turn the DA from a political party into a political pariah in South Africa because they don't represent the people. And you have, at least with the ANC, you have a history there of values and principles that are publicly stated, that they were public, publicly committed to. They believed in something at one point. They stood for something at one point. And you can publicly, you, you can call them to account for that. The, the, the DA it's, that doesn't work with them. They're not a they're not a, a party that's based on values and morals and, and principles and decency. They don't have a back. Uh, they don't have a, a track record of that. So you can't call them to account. Oh, why don't you believe in equality? Well, they never did believe in equality. Why don't you support justice? Well, you never did. With the ANC, you can call them to account for that. So I, I think I, I've heard also Pastor Bosak talking about the need for the public uh, uh, reiteration of values. And that there, therefore we can re return because someone was talking about, I'm sorry, I, I might have missed who it was, was talking about how uh, the approach to politics has become very cynical. The approach even to act activism has become very cynical and that you've removed morality and decency and values and principles from even the discourse because this isn't just how this isn't the real world. That's not how power works. Well, that's the way people work. That's the way the society lives. That's those. That's what we actually live by. So we have an expectation that you should actually live by that too. You should uh, govern by that means too. And we have to hold you to account for that. But you, you need a party that actually uh, has articulated 
any kind of a values and principles and beliefs and morals that the population that that reflects the values and principles of the population and at least the ANC has uh, has articulated that in the past and they have a, a, a track record in the past uh, of standing for those values so I think that you, you need to re-inject this into the conversation uh and I'm afraid I, I I'm already over time but that's fine I, I think you, uh, all right thank you so much yeah I, th I think uh, it's phenomenal that uh Having the three of you um, uh, on board with us, Alan, I mean, the, your, your point on Musa and faith groups and the activism that's going on there is really a point to align on. We should work together on that. And Tato, uh, you know, you said be for, be for all of South Africans um, and, and re-engage with the activ activism and citizenry, which we intend to do and which we are doing. And uh, your point on BRICS, uh, Shahid, is actually addressing the core of the problem. And I hope that it will evolve that whole economic transformation with everything else that we want to achieve. Uh, so with those few words, let me hand over to our chairperson, our chair lady of uh, Musa. Karuna, please go ahead and uh, close the session for us, summarize and uh, take us to the next steps. Uh, uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, I think you've already summarized it very well. But perhaps we just need to share with people that, you know, this is just the start of a conversation. Uh, it's quite clear that all of us are grappling with what the GNU actually means for us and how it's going to impact in our lives and whether we agree with it or not. But whatever it is, we have a GNU in the country, which uh, is the outcome of the elections. And perhaps what we need to do is begin to look at what change means, change for the individual, change for the country, change in governance. Um, and, you know, we need to really begin to say, uh, how do we awaken people into a new way of accepting that the world has changed? We know more sitting in the 19th and 20th centuries. We, are, we now have technology. We now have a whole lot of things. Even the economic activity is a lot more sophisticated in the world. And so uh, I think we're saying in Musa that, you know, we host these webinars to actually start a conversation um, we are nonpartisan, so uh, Tato, we open to everybody. Um, we're willing to talk to everybody. Um, all we want is for people to rethink um, where they stand and to begin to transform themselves. So perhaps the very first big transformation is that, you know, the GNU is not about leaders only. It's about everybody, it's about people's lives. Yes, we do want to know whether the leaders who are sitting there to govern the country will actually meet each other halfway in the interests of the country and of the people. But we also would like to know whether in transforming society and having transformative actions, whether the people and their leaders actually get closer to each other. Now, Musa is not a mass-based organization. We are a very small lobby group. We are a group of individuals who are very concerned about what is happening in South Africa and what is happening in the world. And so we look at socioeconomic transformation. We look at socio justice transformation. And uh, Reverend Musak, uh, it's been great to have you on. Uh, I think we we interacting with each other forty years down the line. So I'm I'm much older now, but uh, I, I I I did work with you in the UDF as well as in the SACC on the International Year of the Youth. And I think your point about you know getting the faith leaders together. One of our focuses in Musa is to actually engage with faith-based uh, communities. And in the near future, we will be hosting a meeting with the faith-based community to ensure that, they, that we begin to look at the values and ethical practices that we need to begin to build from bottom up. 
from, from the community going upwards to leadership of the country. In terms of the international focus, we really need to begin to look at what are the threads for unity that we could forge globally, because we are one family in the world and the economy is very integrated. And so if there's inequalities in the world, or even in one country, it's all about the economy and we need to bring it together. So with those few words, I'd like to say thank you to our uh, speakers, uh, our panelists and the team. And of course, to all of you who have stayed on, um, I think this uh, seminar uh, has a lot of questions, uh, very few answers. And uh, perhaps we could end with this promise that all the big questions that are asked, we will sift them out and arrange future seminars and debates and webinars that we could actually continue this conversation that we've started to rethink what we need to do to transform society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corona. For all those that want a recording of the session, please put down your contact details in the chat and we will forward you a copy either by email or WhatsApp. So your telephone number and email address would be useful. To all our guests, to everybody that's attended, thank you very much. Uh, the program is now officially ended. Uh, you may stop the recording. And yes, Abu, I see your hand up. We can continue conversing for those who are still on.